tapping into having an awareness of what hunger is speaking and honoring that hunger non-judgmentally when we're feeling that gentle hunger whispering at us um, can start to rebuild that sense of body trust. Wow. Welcome back to the Dr. Crockett Show. For those of you just joining us, you should really go check out episode 22 and 21 Mm -hmm. because uh, episode 22 is actually part one of this discussion that I'm having with my amazing guest, Sam Blumenthal. Thank you. She is an integrative eating. Intuitive. intuitive. Dang it. It's okay. Okay, I'm going to do the. (laughs) Um, She is an intuitive eating. Yeah. Dietitian. Yes. And I learned the definition of a dietitian and the difference between that and a nutritionist. Check it out in the bone broth episode, which is episode 21, the Mm -hmm. collagen uh, episode. Yeah. All right. So we are talking about making peace with food. Yes, we are. And you mentioned towards the end of the last uh, conversation Mm -hmm. that we were having, you mentioned the word hunger. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give you just a minute to talk about that. That's such a topic. Right. And kind of the quite profound, beautiful, interesting thing about hunger is there are many different voices and different kinds of hunger, all of which are valid. There is no wrong way. Are you talking about hungry. like uh, hangry is one of them? Mm, so that falls within a category. So we have four different kinds. The first is a physical or a biological hunger. Okay. And this is our body's cue that it's in need of fuel. It's in need of energy or food. Okay. And it's quite interesting because when we are relying on those external cues, right, that might even look like a clock, right? Is it time to eat yet, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Or an app determining how much we should or should not be eating, which ties back into our conversation just previously. Um, We are overlooking our body's innate wisdom and cues. So because physical hunger is a biological cue, just like going to the bathroom, if either one of us or any of our uh, listeners listening or viewers watching this, if you felt the need to use the restroom, I don't... You wouldn't go, oh, it's not time. Yeah, we do in the operating room all the time. We're like, no, it's not time yet. Special circumstances, (laughs) right? Special (laughs) circumstances. No, but I get what you're saying because... But I don't trust myself to uh, know my hunger cue Mm -hmm. and, um, and trust it that it's different from... The just, I want something to eat, mm. craving kind of thing, which I'm going to let you go through the four kinds of hunger, then we can get into that. Yeah. Well, well, and not knowing each of these hungers at first is so valid, and it makes so much sense, um, especially when it comes to physical hunger. Because if we've spent years ignoring or not honoring our hunger cues, I almost like to imagine our hunger cues whether our stomach's growling or we're feeling a gnawing in our throat or we're even thinking about food. Food. Um, We have headaches or we're feeling lightheaded. And these are just a few examples. And everybody experiences hunger a little bit differently. It's unique to every individual. It's also unique to us day to day and meal to meal. Um, I like to think of those hunger cues as like my best friend knocking on the door and trying to hang out with me. Right. That's so healthy. Yeah. Sam, you're so stinking healthy. <laughs> I'm in the process of learning how to make peace with food and my body and, and viewing things in this way, viewing hunger in this way, um, feels really non judgmental. Yeah, it does. So when my best friend's knocking on the door, years and years of restricting or tightly controlling what it is that I was or was not eating is almost like not right. answering the door for your best friend. Right. And your your friend just wants to hang out with you, right? <laughs> so, okay, she goes home, she comes back the next day and she starts knocking. But again, it's not time to eat, whatever, you know, the restriction is. Think about years and years of ignoring your best friend. Oh, yeah. She's going to kind of get the message and stop coming around. Really? Mm-hmm. So it's like down-regulating the signal. Yeah, we are. I kind of like to call it that our hunger cues might be offline, so to speak. And wow. we're not irreparably broken. 
just like if our Wi-Fi well, was to cut news. out. Yeah, isn't that great news? Yes. And tapping into having an awareness of what hunger is speaking and honoring that hunger non-judgmentally when we're feeling that gentle hunger whispering at us um, can start to rebuild that sense of body trust. Wow. Okay. So a way that I like to measure or look at a physical hunger is kind of taking a moment to rate my hunger from one to 10, a meter from one to 10. One is a ravenous, painful, empty hunger, which doesn't feel so physically pleasant, I would say. And 10 is a very painful feeling of fullness, almost eating beyond a comfortable fullness. Okay. Kind of just taking a moment to notice where you are on that meter. And as human beings, we'll be on every single number of that meter, right? Morally, there's no wrong or right place to be. The goal is just using a tool like this to flex the muscle of body attunement to say, hey, where am I right now? Because I like to envision that as almost like a bow and an arrow. The longer you pull back and wait until you're all the way at one, what's going to happen when you're finally around food and you let go? Eating beyond that place of comfortable fullness. So noticing when we experience a gentle hunger can be a very helpful place to be. But all in all, practical hunger is just a biological, physical hunger. Our bodies need for fuel. All right, so that's the first type of hunger. That's the first type of hunger. Uh, the second type of hunger is a mouth hunger. Really? Mm-hmm. Like my my mouth just wants uh-huh. a candy bar? Yeah, it's like a mouth or a mental hunger. It wants a salt, something salty? Exactly. So it's a specific aspect of food okay. that you're craving and desiring. All right. So kind of tying in our previous conversation letting go of the shoulds, getting curious about the what do I want? What do I need? I have permission to eat this Snickers bar. Okay, well, if I have a taste for it, let me honor that. Let me practice honoring that while also having awareness over where am I at on my hunger and fullness meter? Okay. If I arrive to that Snickers bar and I start opening it and I'm aware that this is coming from a place of mouth or mental hunger, I have permission to honor that. And then also say, okay, maybe I'm a six from one to 10. I'm like at a sweet spot right now. My loving choice may probably be to have a few bites of this bar versus going on autopilot and saying the whole thing and maybe even a second or a third or a fourth. And if that resonates with you, I want you to know that's very, it's valid that that's happening because if we're coming from a place of restriction, yeah. the other side of that is the, I'll just go all out because we're not giving ourselves that permission. Right. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but that, that when you get to the F it, I'm going to do whatever mm-hmm. thing, that's the opposite of the tight discipline restriction and Mm -hmm. balance means being in the space in between it's almost like a pendulum yep so on one side if if there is this tight control the other side is out of control and we're almost taught and have more experience bouncing between these two extremes which is very black and white which is very all or nothing and what we have an opportunity to do is to live in the gray yep that's where it's at so that's the second kind of hunger that's the third The third kind is practical hunger. Like I'm going to go run a marathon. I need some fuel. Um, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful example of what practical hunger can be. Another way that I like to think of practical hunger is like making yourself go to the bathroom before a long road trip. Okay. Just to prevent from future discomfort. Yep. So a helpful guideline, um, is to go no longer than five waking hours without eating something. Okay. And so if I check in with my hunger and fullness meter, so to speak, at 9 a.m. and I'm at like a seven, I'm comfortable, I'm fine, okay. Now, I'm also going to tap into my rational thinking and say, okay, well, I know the next time food will be available is not going to be until after my meetings, after my drive, I'm not going to arrive home until five o'clock at night. Okay. That is a long window of time without eating. So even if I'm not hungry, 
it might serve me to eat a little something so I don't essentially pull back on that bow and arrow and feel ravenous. That makes sense. And or pack something with me and think ahead. I think we spend more time and attention charging our iPads and our phones than we do attending attending to ourselves. Yeah. So that's practical hunger, just kind of tying in that awareness from okay. a rational point. Um, and then the fourth is one of my favorites to talk about, which is emotional <laughs> hunger. Uh huh. Our emotional hunger. We tend to think of it or hear it as emotional overeating, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. It's just emotional hunger. I eat because it makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice in a lot of the language, you may or may not have noticed in the language that I use, I've actually worked on removing the phrase overeating. Yeah, you have. I haven't heard you say it at all. I feel that that phrase overeating is describing that there's some arbitrary perfect number to or amount to stop. And then after that, it's all over. And the shame and the guilt. Right. If we assess how we're feeling in that moment, maybe I ate beyond a comfortable fullness can start to unpack and remove that judgment. So emotional eating is not inherently bad. It's actually one of the beautiful parts of life. It's okay to emotionally eat? 100%. Oh my gosh. That's one of the many purposes of food. Food is meant to also help us soothe and comfort. I have never, ever heard anybody uh -huh. say that before in my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. And perhaps this will provide some reason to it. The two basic human needs that a baby needs is to be held and to be fed. And oftentimes, yep. those two things happen at the exact same time. Well, exactly. Breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. Even bottle feeding. Mm -hmm. So from birth, we associate something sweet with that sense of comfort or eating for that matter with that sense of comfort fast forward to today we are shaming and blaming and judging ourselves for doing that when that's one of the beauties and the joys of food is is tying in that emotional it really piece. is and you know you hear people with long covid talking about when they've lost their sense of smell and taste and how mm -hmm. that's impacted their that mm -hmm. part of the enjoyment from eating mm -hmm. it, it's really alarming and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. When food becomes our primary and only coping mechanism, when things are feeling uncomfortable and we notice a pattern of eating past a place of comfortable fullness, then this perhaps is an opportunity to start getting curious rather than judgmental and saying, okay, there's some unmet need <laughs> going on here. Yeah. How can I expand my emotional coping toolkit to say, I always have permission to have the food. Is that serving me? Is that helping me? Is that filling that unmet need? Yeah. Sometimes maybe, sometimes maybe not. Yeah. So the next question might be, okay, how do I do that? So if we notice and we can recognize, oh, this is emotional hunger talking right now, like, Maybe uh, it's not the emotional hunger that's serving me in this moment. The first question I like to ask is, what emotion am I feeling right now? You have an emotion and wheel. And I, I have a feelings wheel. Oh, so, so awesome. yeah, if you're watching this, you'll see I, I got this from Amazon. It was meant to be an art piece because I, I use this to communicate with others. I use this to communicate and better understand myself. And it, I just find it to be a helpful tool. So, sweet Dr. Crockett, if you want to kind of explain for like any okay. listeners, like what do you, what does a feelings wheel look like? Okay, so we've used this in mm -hmm. life coaching also. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the very center of the wheel, it's got one, two, three, four, seven basic emotions. Yeah, and so often in our society and our upbringing, um, we tend to just when we think about how we're feeling, we label it with one of these very seven, very general, mm -hmm. I'm angry, I'm happy, I'm sad. Um, the seven words are surprised, bad, fearful, angry, disgusted, sad, and happy. One of the things we learn as we become the watcher of ourselves mm -hmm. and more aware of our feelings and emotions and thoughts is that there are a whole lot of 
different nuances of those words. Mm-hmm. And so this wheel goes out and further out. So if you're feeling fearful, are you anxious? Are you inadequate? Are you feeling worthless? Or if you're happy, are you accepted, valued, courageous, creative, loving? There are all of these mm-hmm. m- more defining words that this gives us the vocabulary to to really consider what we're doing. And as you start working with this, listening to your body and feeling your feelings and being able to label them, you can feel how they are different vibrationally in your Mm -hmm. body. And then you have the ability to generate a new thought to change that vibration if you choose. Yeah, yes. I love the language that you've used to describe that. When we can better identify the emotion that we're feeling, Mm -hmm. we can better understand what it is that we need. Right. So, for example, if I were to use this and I notice that, you know, maybe I'm, I'm feeling sad, but if I dig deeper, maybe what I'm really feeling is lonely. Okay. So if I'm feeling lonely, then what do I need? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. And maybe it's connection. Maybe I can use food as a form of connection if it's helping me feel connected with others, going and sharing a meal. Maybe it's preparing a family recipe and feeling connected within my family and feeling that nostalgic kind of ritual practice as well. And maybe if I notice that maybe I'm maybe food might not be the thing that will serve me right now. What is something else that I can do beyond the realm of food, food to that feel. might provide that sense of connection Mm -hmm. is that going on a walk with with toper is that engaging in some kind of art project is that listening to music that matches my emotions so i feel heard i feel seen um we have so many senses beyond just our taste so what can we touch what can we see what can we hear what can we smell right and starting to get curious about the other senses that can help us feel connected if we notice that food might not be the answer in this moment. Yep, I mm-hmm. I love that. I uh, I like that you're using the word curious, and uh, instead of judgmental, mm-hmm. having compassion and mm-hmm. being curious. That uh, we did a whole episode on that with my sister. Mm-hmm. Chris, it's a Christine mm-hmm. episode. Um, I can't remember which one it was. One of the earlier ones, like episode six or seven. If our listeners want to go back, but um, and you know what, we'll link it. We can link it in the show notes. But the interesting thing about that with food and what you're talking about in uh, expanding our awareness and then our uh, using all of our other senses is um, that may be things other than food that like music or other activities that would suit us. But we were talking as we were doing the prep for the show downstairs about actually tuning into what textures and smells of food we're really wanting. So it's not always just, I need a Cheetos. Cheetos are kind of my, like... I love that. That's my go-to cheat. Cheetos. Uh, I like the salty of Cheetos. So I was thinking about what are the textures of foods? Like, why are the Cheetos the thing that I like? Because I don't really love the way they taste. Mm. Um they're kind of Mm corn-based, and Mm -hmm. when I really eat them, I'm like, this doesn't taste that good. But the salty and the crunch Mm -hmm. are the sensations that I'm wanting. Mm -hmm. And so one thought that I had is the next time I want a Cheeto, what else could I substitute for that where I would actually like the taste of it too? And I, I do that already. Pistachios, I love them. I love that you're exploring that question from a place of curiosity and a place of a sensory experience. And I say this because uh, the a huge narrative in, in our society is how can I healthify this, right? It's, oh, these are brownies. Well, here are protein packed brownies only made of avocado and black beans. And yeah. yeah, like if that's the taste and the experience that you want, wonderful. For it. <laughs> if there's a moment where you're like, I want the brownies from the box because I love the richness. I love the aroma, the texture, the smell. The It reminds me of uh, babysitting my younger sister when I was a kid or wh- whatever the case yeah. may be. Then you have permission to make either choice that feels right for you. I think we've 
grown, or at least in, in my in my experience, I've grown way too familiar with healthifying absolutely everything to have protein, to have this, to have that, to not have this, not have that. And it's like, okay, if that's a choice coming from self-care and your intention and your desire to experience the full sensory experience of that specific thing, awesome. Lovely. Go for it. And if it's from restriction... May, then this is an opportunity for us to get curious about, to say, is that framework, is that thought pattern, are, is that serving you? That's really today? what mindful eating is, isn't mm, it? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's bringing in that consciousness to the eating experience and that awareness. And I'd love to leave our listeners and our viewers with three different tips to implement awesome. a little bit more mindfulness. Um, so the first one, Dr. Crockett, I, I love because you've already so beautifully mentioned this just a moment oh. ago with Cheetos. While you are eating next time, can you get curious and identifying two to three characteristics oh. of what you're eating that you enjoy? Yeah. Do you like the flavor? Do you like the texture, the temperature, the aroma? Just notice that. Um, the second is while you're eating, can you identify two to three characteristics you maybe don't love so much. That's so funny. We didn't even talk about that ahead of time. And I, uh -huh. I just cued that right up. To, mm -hmm. to, yeah. So allow this to be kind of the, the yeah, like you're doing yeah. it. You're, we're putting language to behaviors that we're already doing and increasing our awareness to saying, oh, doing this for the most part or trying to tie this in while I eat is mindful. I already, I'm already doing it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it can be valuable to identify those two or three things that you maybe don't love is because if you're not enjoying the eating experience, and if you're not enjoying what it is that you're eating, you can change it. You can change it for the most part, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, there might be instances where maybe that's not a possibility, um, and that's okay. But if we start to give ourselves, or once we start to give ourselves permission to have the quote unquote off limits foods, we might discover that there's actually like maybe a few things we're not we don't really love about it we've just held it on a pedestal yeah for all this time and so getting curious about how you feel about that food how that food makes you feel can be really valuable in just being present in that eating experience because oftentimes we are moving way too quickly right. while we're eating uh that's setting us up to arrive to a place of feeling uncomfortably full yeah eating past that point of physical comfort and the last tool is kind of tying in something we'd mentioned with our physical hunger, which is bringing awareness to your hunger and fullness meter. Right. So I like to use this meter still to this day three times during a meal for the most part. Okay. So at first, when you sit down before you eat, just flexing that muscle of attunement. One to 10, where am I right now? This is nobody else's business. You don't have to share this with anybody. You can do this and no one's gonna know mm -hmm. by doing it. Like kegels. <laughs> I've been doing them the whole time. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, where am I? One to 10, great, okay. Now, as you're eating, can you notice the point where you're no longer hungry? You're no longer feeling hunger. That doesn't mean you have to stop. All that means is you're noticing that you no longer feel Hungry. hungry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so take a few more bites. Take a moment to pause. If this was my last bite, would I feel both mentally and physically satisfied? That's the, great. And if the answer is no, take another bite. Mm -hmm. Take a few more bites. Okay, come back to that question. All right, if this was my last bite, would I feel both mentally or even emotionally and physically satisfied? What if the answer is no? Take another bite. Mm -hmm. Keep going, this right? This is intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. And now, okay, if this was my last bite, would I feel both emotionally and physically satisfied? When what the answer is yes, then you stop. Mm -hmm. And now you're in the driver's seat making that decision, saying, okay, from the place of self-care, my loving choice, I feel that I'm at a comfortable fullness yeah. right now versus self-control and i shouldn't have any more that's vastly different mindsets mm -hmm. so cool mm -hmm. thank you for bringing this to our awareness today 
It was a really rich conversation. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for bringing your expertise and your knowledge. And uh, I'll have to do some more of this. We're just scratching the surface. Just scratching the surface. This is course one. Course one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I I truly appreciate it. It's been such a pleasure. And and Topher, thanks you too. So it's been a fun day. You want to remind our listeners where they can find you? Uh, On Instagram, uh, fulfilledandfull.rd. And on TikTok, fulfilledandfull. You'll find different mindful and intuitive eating tips, um, skits, things to kind of bring in a little joy to this experience. Because if you're noticing a little discomfort uh, throughout this conversation, I want to validate that. And also, if you welcome me into this journey, I want to invite in a little bit of kind of humor and and positivity as well. Um, Because life's too short. Life's too short. (laughs) And we deserve to enjoy eating experiences and also the the healing and growing process. Right. As well. Yeah. Love that. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, you guys, that is all we have for today. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Um, If you think this is valuable information and you've got friends that you think would um, like to listen to it or be healed in listening to it, feel free to share and like and subscribe and all the things. And we will see you next week on The Dr. Crockett Show. Bye.